We practice concentration as our food on the path. Try to settle the mind with one object, like the breath, and bring the mind to the object in a way that it feels at ease, it has a sense of fullness, refreshment. And so you work with the breath to see what kind of breathing would feel good. And then you learn to live with that sense of well-being. This is why we practice, so we can come back to it again and again. To keep, keep ourselves nourished. So we're not so hungry for other pleasures. Because as the Buddha said, you look at pleasures not so much as whether you like them or not. The question is, what effect do they have on the mind? What do they lead you to do? Ordinarily, we go for the pleasures of the senses, sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations that we like. We keep going for them again and again because, as I would have said, for most of us we don't see any other alternative to pain. So even though they may have their drawbacks, we're willing to put up with them. But if you have this alternative pleasure, the pleasure that comes from settling the mind in, you can begin to look at those drawbacks. And you can begin to see which pleasures are having a bad effect on the mind and which ones are having a good effect. Because not all sensual pleasures are bad. As the Buddha said, he doesn't deny that pleasures can be okay. But it's an issue for each one of us to figure out which ones are okay for us and which ones are not. There's some general principles. The pleasure that comes from going out into nature is relatively harmless. The pleasure of solitude and the pleasure of being in the company of other people when there's a sense of harmony in the group. These are good, as long as that group is abiding by the precepts. But then there are other pleasures that are more of an individual matter. Think about alcohol as an, as an analogy. Alcohol is never good, but some people taste it and they don't feel any attraction to it at all. Other people can't get enough. So you have to ask yourself, which pleasures do you have that you can't get enough of? <clears throat> and what do they do to the mind? Because you've got to look at the effect. We can't just be consumers, consumers, consumers all the time. True happiness comes from having skills, being able to maneuver through the difficulties of life without suffering from them. And you don't learn those skills simply by indulging in pleasures. In fact, the more you indulge in pleasures, most pleasures, the weaker it makes you. You get hooked on certain pleasures, and you get really irritated when you can't have them. Those are the kind of pleasures that are really bad for you. Think about that experiment where they put, found the little pleasure center in the brains of little mice. And so they put a electrode right into it, and then they had a little plate on the mouse's head, and the mouse could touch the plate against a another plate and got a little tiny charge, just enough to stimulate the little pleasure center. And they found that when they put mice, mice in cages where they could do this, they would just sit there with a little plate against the bar, and they'd die. The pleasure was enough for them, but they didn't care about eating or anything at all. They just wanted the pleasure. This is what happens to our goodness if we just keep going for pleasures without any concern for what they're doing for the mind. So we have to remind ourselves we're not here just consuming pleasures as much as we can. We're agents. We're acting in the world, acting inside the mind as well. And what kind of actions 
are our pleasures and pains inducing in us? Because we have to learn how to respond well to both. How to respond to pain in a way that's good for the mind, how to respond to pleasure in a way that's good for the mind. Think about the qualities the Buddha himself developed on his path. One was, as he said, lack of contentment with, with skillful qualities. In other words, he always kept wanting to perfect his skills even more. If there was still any bit of, the slightest bit of disturbance or un disease in his mind, he would not rest content. He would just keep working. And what did he develop? What qualities did he employ as he kept working at the path? He listed three. Heedfulness, ardency, resolution. Heedfulness is the proper attitude to have when you realize that your actions do make a difference. And they're going to determine whether you suffer and whether you don't. And so you've got to be very careful about what you do. This, of course, goes back on those issues of pleasure and pain. Which pleasures are okay? Which pleasures are heedful pleasures? In other words, you in indulge in them, you enjoy them, and they're actually good for the mind. Concentration is a good pleasure in that way. Then there's ardency. You keep trying to develop more and more skill. A resolution is when you're strong in the face of difficulties. So the pleasure of concentration is one way of developing these qualities. But on its own, it's not enough. After all, some people get into nice concentration and they just stay there. They get content. They say, this is good enough for me. And of course, that's their choice. The Buddha is not up there giving orders to anybody. But he is saying, if you stay there, they're going to be dangerous. So we have to contemplate the dangers of even a nice state of concentration. If you simply sit here and get lazy, you're going to be carrying that habit of laziness back into the world. This is why concentration has to be developed together with an inquisitive, curious mind. It wants to know what's better than this. What's more solid? What's more reliable than this? This is the voice of heedfulness, asking those questions. And then when you see that there is a certain laziness in your concentration, okay, you, that's where you bring in the ardency. That it's good to rest here and get rested, but you've got to use your strength for something of more value. It's like just eating, 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 but not using your strength that comes from eating. You've got to ask yourself, what more? What more is there? What's better? Then you keep at this. That's the resolution. So you have to ask yourself as you go through life, the pleasures that you're enjoying, are they helping make you more heedful, ardent, and resolute, or are they getting in the way? Are they making you apathetic, listless, and weak? As living beings, we're not just sitting here in the present moment. The present moment is going in a certain direction. Then you have to look at the qualities you're developing in the present moment and ask yourself, what direction is this present moment taking me to? The present moment is not a place where you sit, it's a place where you work. It's your path. The Buddha saw that we're all on different paths. It's not the case, it's not the case that we suddenly decide we would like to have a path in life when we come to the practice. We're already on a path of one kind or another, leading someplace. All too often we have no idea where that path is leading. 
But the Buddha can describe the different paths and where they go. You can ask yourself, given the way I'm living my life, which path am I on? Am I on the path to a good destination or a bad one? If it's a bad one, you can turn around, go in a better direction. If you're on a good one, this is when you have to stick with it and have that inquisitive mind. I was in the John who came to visit us here. And some people took him to some of the national parks, and they said every path he got onto, he said, oh, let's see how far the path goes. What's around the next bend? What's around the next bend? Well, that's the kind of mind you have to have as you're meditating. What's around the next bend? You don't want to just rest satisfied where you are, because that's a path that slides down. There's a hill in Lassen National Park. It's covered with very fine little bits of lava. And if you climb up the hill, as long as you're climbing, you can go up the hill. But if you stop, you begin to realize that you're sliding down. So sometimes just to stay in place, you have to keep walking. If you don't, you just end up sliding all the way back down to the bottom of the hill. That's the way it is with the practice. If you stand still too long, you start sliding down. Now, this doesn't mean you shouldn't be enjoying the concentration. You should. And you should have a sense of when it is right to just simply rest in the concentration. But then you want to make sure you put it to good use. That you're not just feeding, 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 and getting a fat mind. You're trying to feed the mind so it's strong enough to do the work that needs to be done. Wherever there's still ignorance, there's going to be suffering, however subtle it may be. So look at your pleasures, look at your pains, and ask yourself, in indulging in these things, where am I going? Where are they taking me? Are they really my friends? Am I really a friend to myself? Some pains are actually your friends. And John Zawat was talking one time about how when he had malaria, he learned an awful lot about the mind. And as he said, if malaria was something he could find, or a person he could find and thank him, he'd need to thank the malaria for the lessons he learned. So look at both your pleasures and your pains and your relationship to them. And focus on the pleasures and pains that are skillful, i.e. that lead you to act in a skillful way. That's how you stay on the path and keep yourself from sliding back. <laughs>